Hi everyone. This is a lecture review for Chapter 6, which is called Off to School. Um, cognitive Physical Development in Middle Childhood is the topic. So our learning objectives, we've talked about Piaget a bit in class, but I'll, I'll mention that here just to kind of keep us up to speed. And then we'll talk about memory, intelligence, and end with some physical development. So we've talked about Piaget, we reviewed his first two stages, and then in class recently we talked about his last two stages, so stages three and four. Stage three is concrete operational, and with these people, with these children, because it's ages seven to 11, we're getting to really see that they can um, make a, a lot more sense of their world, make a lot more sense of their environment, but they're still very concrete. So they have trouble um, understanding things that are abstract, that are difficult to, to really um, touch or feel, things like justice or um, truth, you know, things that are really um, kind of up there in the abstract world. They just don't get that quite yet. So if you ask a concrete operational kid, um, you know, how can we make this work, feathers, breaking windows, they would not be able to abstract and, and think of a way that they can make this work. But our formal operational kids, this is ages 11 plus, so Piaget would say we're all formal operational, um, they can use reason, they can abstract. And so they use things or they understand things like this um, saying here, all men are mortal, Socrates is man, Socrates is mortal. So they can use that deductive reasoning to understand abstract situations. And they can even do that with things like feathers and windows. So who says the feather has to be a regular bird-sized feather? We could have a massive feather. We could have a tiny, you know, flexible window made out of candy sugar. You know, there's many ways to make this scenario work. So they can think a lot broader in this situation. The three-stage model is of memory. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about memory, memory strategies, how we're seeing memory come into play with these kids as they start school. So with memory, we all have, or we think we all have, these three um, components. So the sensory memory is what's coming in from your environment. It's very short term. So right now it's my voice that's coming into you from your environment. You would bring that then, if you pay attention, into your short term memory. So you'd be able to kind of work on that information. You're paying attention to it. You're re remembering things you read in the book, and it's all getting combined together. If you encode all of that, which we hope you do, you know, um, then it would go to long-term memory. And in your long-term memory, you'd be able to use it then for longer periods of time. You'd be able to bring up developmental psych 20 years from now and say, hey, I remember that thing, and I've got it. You know, I remember. So that's what we hope <laughs> would be the case. Um, I know I, I can't remember everything I learned in college, but hopefully the, the good stuff, you know, will get it, and you'll, you'll keep it. Um, I really love the movie Inside Out. If you haven't seen it yet, I would totally recommend this movie. Um, but they have memories here represented in these little golden balls. Uh, we don't seem to have these balls in our head that we can, you know, touch or feel. But it's still a really interesting analogy. And I think that um, if you watch this movie after um, taking it in the psych class, you get a lot out of it. It's really, really good. But yeah, right here we see all these memories. They're tinged different colors with emotional content. They're stored, they're registered. Um, we see endless long-term memory storage. It's, it's just really fun. Uh, memory development. So we see kids kind of going through specific patterns or stages. Our seven to eight-year-olds often try to rehearse. So if you ask them to bring you a glass of orange juice, they might say a glass of OJ, glass of OJ, glass of OJ, glass of OJ. So they're just saying it over and over and over. And it really doesn't work very well. Because if you've ever tried to do that, like, Oh, I'm going to call dominoes, and you're like, try to remember the number, it just goes away, you know. So uh, what's more effective to use then is elaboration, so making it relevant to yourself, thinking, you know, broadly about the situation. So you could think, you know, oh, oranges grow in Florida. We went to Florida last week, and so my mom wants a glass of Florida. Orange, you know, just kind of goofy, but still just elaborating on it, making it bigger. Um, we do that with things like mnemonics. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Um, Meta-memory is something that people can get confused by, but all this is saying is that we have an understanding of our memory, and we monitor whether or not our strategies are working well. So if you do try to call dominoes by just repeating the number to yourself, and then you keep forgetting it, you might have this meta-memory sense like, dude, my strategy is not very good. <laughs> it's not working. And we get to kind of see that in school. So you might think you have a great strategy for remembering all the body parts. But then you go take a test and you're like, oh, no, my strategy was horrible. So I need a new strategy. So uh, we've all kind of experienced that idea of kind of understanding our own memory. 
Metacognition is very similar. So with this, we have knowledge, awareness of our cognitive processes. And so um, we ask ourselves questions like, what do I know? What do I need to learn? And how will I know when I've learned it? Which is important, and that's one a lot of us struggle with because, you know, this is what leads us to study too much, so we've overprepared, or to study too little because we don't know, have we learned it or not? So these are skills that take a lot of time to develop, but we start seeing kids be able to use these skills. Um, here's some great metacognitive um, thoughts. You know, what's my goal? How motivated am I? What do I already know? So if you already know a lot about the topic, you don't need to study it for 18 hours. You know, you could get away with just a couple hours. Um, so how much time is it going to take me to study? And what strategies work for me? Because that's something that develops over time, that we have those experiences. We learn, you know, something that works for me may not work for you or vice versa. So you kind of learn a little bit about yourself and what works. So we're going to talk about intelligence. And with intelligence, just to kind of mention, if you love this stuff, if you're like, man, intelligence is my thing, you might want to be a psychometrician. So they do all kinds of psychological tests, but intelligence, personality, these are some of the big ones that psychometricians will do. So intelligence, what does it mean to be intelligent? I've linked a crash course down here you may want to watch. It gives a lot of good information. You don't have to. But um, just kind of thinking, what does it mean to be intelligent? If you ask yourself that question, um, you know, I don't think that everyone's answer would be exactly the same. So, and we definitely see it's not the same in psych research. So um, we've got this hierarchical view. This is one person's kind of view. And he says that we have this general intelligence factor that's at the very top in blue. And that's G. And then G is comprised of many different kinds of abilities. So he says, you know, our fluid and crystallized intelligence, perception, speed, that all of this kind of contributes up to this idea of having our G. So you'd be able to tell your G factor. But really, um, this is interesting work, and, and people sometimes, you know, follow this theory, but it doesn't really have a lot of um, empirical backing, you know, research backing. Um, another theory that people have utilized, which I think is pretty interesting myself, um, is this idea of multiple intelligence. So it would say that we might be um, really smart in certain domains and less, maybe less intelligent in other domains. But you can have people who are really good with bodily kinesthetics, so they play sports super well, um, musical, rhythmic, existential, which are those big issues in life, like why are we here, what's our purpose, you know, those kind of big lofty things. Um, logical, mathematical, naturalistic is a great understanding of the, of the world, like the physical features of the world, the plants, the animals, kind of nature. Visuospatial or artists. Interpersonal, these people are great at being able to um, communicate with others. Intrapersonal is being able to understand oneself, which is interesting. And then verbal linguistic is, um, you know, talking and writing. And so Gardner and people who follow this theory would say that you can be high on some of these and less high on others. So you might be really good with bodily kinesthetic and existential issues, but less good with visual spatial issues. Emotional intelligence is something that got a lot of press a couple decades ago. Um, but the idea here with emotional intelligence is that you can really use emotions. You understand them, you perceive them well, you manage them well. Um, I linked a video in here of Sheldon from Big Bang Theory, kind of showing how he does not really have great emotional intelligence, as well as a video that can explain these concepts. But, um, you know, really emotional intelligence is just being able to understand, to use these emotions. And so um, this person here in this comic would not have good emotional intelligence. So, yeah, I think I have good people skills. What kind of idiot question is that? You know, if that's your response, it's probably not um, super emotionally intelligent at that time. Um, Sternberg gave us another idea of intelligence, and this one, he said intelligence, what we need to have for intelligence is ways to meet our goals. So he said some of this intelligence looks analytical, so this is often what we think of measuring um, when we measure intelligence, you know, things like math problems, English, like how do we work out um, logical issues, um, but, but there's also other types of, of um, intelligence, according to Sternberg, including creative, and then practical. So with practical versus analytical, we're kind of talking book, starts, book smarts versus street smarts a little bit. So practical is being able to put it into action. Intelligence testing. So this is a really interesting kind of con controversial topic. It has a long history, and this is just kind of touching that history, you know, just on the surface touching that history. It's fascinating. 
Um, so where we kind of started with intelligence testing was with Binet and Simon. And so they were tasked with trying to understand, given this big group of um, immigrant children, you know, many people coming in, who was bright and who was dull. And so what they came up with was this idea of mental age. So if you're eight years old in your body, but your mind is like that, you have a mental age of a 10-year-old, then you're bright. But if you're six years old in your body or you're eight years old in your body and your mental age is three, then they say you'd be dull. So what they kind of, they use that measure to kind of understand with this mental age idea how intelligent someone was. And then Terman came and adapted that test and came up with the IQ, which is something we discuss all the time now. So Terman came up with this IQ and he divided your mental age by your chronological age and multiplied it by 100. So where are you in your body and where are you in your mind times 100 would give you an IQ. Now we don't do this mental age, chronological age stuff. We compare it to the same age peers. So if you got your IQ tested at 12, you'd be, you know, modeled against a whole bunch of 12-year-olds to see where you're at. So if we do this kind of modeling and see where everyone is at, the average IQ score is 100. One standard deviation out is um, this range from 84 to 116. So most people then, the vast majority of people are going to fall somewhere in the 84 to 116 range of this um, normal curve here, this bell curve. So if your IQ is something like 52 or 148, then that means there are very few people who share that IQ with you. You know, that is not a, um, a large number of people there on the tails. Most of us fall towards the center. So in a contemporary IQ test, you might get something like the Weschler, Kaufman, and even the Stanford Binet. So you can still get tested on the Stanford Binet. So then what people often ask then is how well do these tests work? And IQ tests, they are valuable, so they do work. IQ, IQ scores predict things like what grades you're going to get, occupational success. So even if we look at people in the same occupation, like um, scientists, those with a higher IQ often have more success in that chosen occupation. And it also predicts longevity. But it's not perfect. So if all of our IQ scores suddenly popped up on top of our head, like we were a sim, you know, and it was like 100 or whatever, like that wouldn't really give us a ton of information. We wouldn't be able to say, who are you, you know, based on that info. So other factors really contribute to our success beyond intelligence. A big one is self-discipline. And so self-discipline, even um, if you have someone's IQ score, if you have this idea of their self-discipline, this can help you predict what they're going to be able to do. So we've probably all known that really smart person who just, like, doesn't care and does whatever they want and, like, doesn't apply themselves. You know, and so they would be low in the self-discipline idea. People can also be high or low in grit. And grit is this idea that you're just not going to quit. So you live life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. Even if things get hard, you keep going. That's a great TED talk about grit, but um, really just saying some people are gritty. So even if life gets them down, they're like, you know what? I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> and they're just gritty. And so some of those factors are even more important than IQ. Uh, we also know that it's important to kind of help students to develop a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. So growth mindset kind of says to us like, oh, you know, um, things are hard, but we're all growing from this. I can grow my intelligence if I try really hard. Um, so a growth mindset to kind of encourage that, you might say something like, when you learn how to do a new kind of problem, it grows your math brain. Or that feeling of math being hard is the feeling of your brain growing. And so I try to tell myself that, you know, and my kids, but it's, you know, just trying to say, um, it's good that it's painful right now. It's supposed to be painful. It will get better. And you are getting smarter. You're getting better. And so kind of that idea that you can grow and that it's not just a static thing. You know, having that mindset really helps too. Um, so talking about heredity, you know, where, do, where does heredity kind of come from? So we know that IQ is um, something that is related to heredity. You know, it's around often the same area where your parents might be. But the environment also plays a really big role. So we have this idea of this reaction range, and this kind of shows how the environment plays a big role. So if you look at this graphic here, you'll see three different um, environments. Enriched is on the top, average, and then deprived. And what you see from these individuals in here is that they have this bar above their heads, and this is their, re their reaction range. So the top guy here, Tom, Tom was in a really enriched environment. 
his IQ looks like it could have gone somewhere from maybe 70 to 84. Because of his environment was so good, it's at that high end. You know, and so we see the same thing for Jerome there in that enriched area. It looks like he might have gone from, you know, 120 to 130, and he's at 127 because of his enriched environment. The average individuals, their, their environment's pretty average, so they're right around the middle of their range. And those individuals who grew up in a deprived environment are then at the lower end of what they're capable of. So even if we look at someone like Alice, the, you know, the last picture there in the deprived section, her IQ is 125. I mean, that is, a, that is a really good IQ, really stellar. You know, she's a smart lady. But if her environment had been better, she could have been, you know, 150. She could have been a genius. She could have cured cancer by now. You know, so um, the environment is important. It really is. Oh, it is. <laughs> um, so talking about environmental influences, this gets us into something that is um, very, very important. Very, um, you know, something that we really need to delve into a little bit more, spend some time in. And that is that when we study ethnic groups, we see some difference in IQ. But what we really know is this is a function of many other parts of the environment. So socioeconomic status is huge. If you are in a school where you have a ton of resources, you have tutors and computers and the best books and everything you would ever need, you're going to have tons and tons of opportunities to develop. Individuals without those resources don't have those opportunities. So socioeconomic status plays a huge role. We also see that some of these tests can be pretty biased. So if you ask a question like all but one of the following are parts of a yacht. I've never been on a yacht. I don't know if any of y'all been on a yacht, but that's not something that's very common for people who did not grow up super wealthy. Um, so what's important then is to use tests that are culture fair. So like this test here is trying to get you to, you know, choose the next thing in a pattern. That's a lot better, a lot more applicable to people than this yacht question. Um, we also need to have experience taking these standardized tests because if you've had a lot of experience, you kind of know how to do this. You can reread answers, do the ones you know, look for context clues and further questions. So you've got lots of strategies in order to do well. But if you don't have a lot of experience, you haven't developed those strategies. And stereotype threat is a social psychological concept, but we really can see this with intelligence tests. So what this comic says, we've got this man, two men here at the chalkboard, and the guy's doing really bad. You know, he's just messing up this math problem. And his friend says, wow, you suck at math. So what's going on here then is that he sucks at math. So his friend just assumes that him, Bob, as a person, sucks. But this other comic strip here, we have a man and a woman. And instead of just making it a personal thing, the man is saying, wow, girls suck at math. <laughs> you know, you, this whole group sucks at math. And so that's stereotype threat. If you know there's a stereotype about your group, you can be worried about kind of conforming to that stereotype, letting your group down, and you can therefore perform less well because you're stressed. You're like, man, I don't want everybody to think I'm stupid. My whole group is stupid, so I need to do well. But then you're so overwhelmed that you do poorly. So that's stereotype threat. So really, when we try to understand to interpret these test scores, what we're really seeing truly is that tests determine, you know, how well we've adapted to this specific context, how well we can answer these questions, and don't necessarily relate to how smart we are. And, and that comic here is one that's often used um, to kind of really show how tests can be unfair. So it says, for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam, climb the tree. Mr. Monkey looks pretty freaking happy. Everyone else looks worried. So, um, you know, really it is about adaptation to your, your context. So after all we've discussed, all of this information about intelligence, just take a second and kind of reflect. And how would you measure, how would you test intelligence if it was up to you? So now we're going to talk a little bit about exceptionalities. And so with gifted children, traditionally it was based on IQ. So an IQ of 130 or above. But now we look for giftedness in all different kinds of domains and really look for this divergent thinking. So how many, you know, kind of answers can you give that are just out of the norm? You know, how many ways can you escape from a boat that's filling up with water? You know, somebody might be able to come up with two or three, but you might have someone who's really gifted who comes up with 47 different ways. You know, so just being able to think differently. So we think the prerequisites for having a gifted child is really the child has to want to do what they're doing. They need early instruction and help, and they really need parents to commit to helping them. Because, you know, if you're going to have the best soccer player ever, 
you're going to take that kid to soccer practice a lot. So parents have to really help and want to do that. For intellectual disability, there are two criteria, and a lot of people are surprised to hear that there are two, because we often think, okay, IQ score. IQ score is important, so we should see um, before 18 years, IQ score of less than or equal to 70. But we also need to see problems adapting to the environment. If the child has a lot of compensatory behaviors, they're really adapting well, then you know we might not apply that label of ID, intellectual disability. Learning, dis learning disabilities are um, a little bit different. So with, with children with learning disabilities, we're not seeing anything with their IQ. Um, oftentimes they have normal to average to above average intelligence. It's not an intelligence thing. They just have trouble for, you know, for some reason, for many different reasons, mastering specific academic subjects. So there are quite a few types of learning disabilities. I put a link in there so you can kind of explore that. But it's not intelligence. It's more of a specific issue related to some form of academic subjects. ADHD, so we can spend a whole class on ADHD, but um, what we kind of see here, I've got the three core symptoms there, so inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. This is something that um, we can see in kids, especially if they start school, that many kids will start, you know, to um, show those symptoms at school age, more so than earlier in life. Um, so there's been large-scale studies of what's best to help children with ADHD, and really the best answer seems to be adding medication and kind of therapy, psychosocial approaches. But this has to be considered something chronic. So many adults, you know, they'll, they'll have ADHD as a child, and then they'll, they'll think, oh, I'm, I've outgrown it and I don't need it anymore. But many times they show symptoms of ADHD in adulthood too. It's often very chronic, you know, lasts for quite a while. That brings us into physical development. We're not going to spend a lot of time in physical development. Um, really just a couple important things, growth, Boys and girls, in the earliest school years, they're about the same size, but around 11 to 12, you get that lovely, awkward middle school dance uh, where the average girl is about a half an inch taller. She's probably got a good foot on him in this picture, but, um, you know, girls are just a little bit taller. Then boys will grow up, um, catch up. <laughs> They'll grow up and catch up. Um, motor skills, girls have certain skills they perform better, like handwriting, some flexibility, but boys are often showing, um, you know, better skills with things that are like more gross motor, um, you know, strength, throwing, catching, jumping, stuff like that. Physical activities, the book mentions in almost every single chapter that obesity is epidemic, so it is. Um, there's lots of risk factors, especially in these middle-aged um, children, so they don't have as much PE time um, or physical education time, recess time, you know, time to move their bodies. There's more sedentary activities. Um, this video I've linked in here is totally goofy, but it was one of my favorite public service announcements as a kid. It's for gopher cakes. So it only takes a minute if you want. <laughs> Just, yeah, it's, it's worth it, I think. Um, and then finally we get to sports. So sports are an awesome thing for kids. So it can promote their self-esteem, make them lose, um, lose weight, you know, maintain their weight, whatever they need to do. It gets them into those social groups. It's really, really good, but kids can lose interest in sports. So if you're like this guy down here, you know, one, two, three, break someone's clavicle, you know, it's too stressful perhaps, um, you know, then kids can lose interest in, in doing that activity. But that brings us to the end of this material, and I hope you all are having a great day. Bye!